Um, good afternoon. Welcome to uh, the Courtauld and welcome to the Center for American Art and our research seminar series and event series. Um, this week begins a number of events that I have organized. Um, my name is Dr. Tom Day. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for American Art and associate lecturer at the Courtauld. And this was originally conceived as to be um, a kind of symposium or a conference, but because of COVID, we've turned it into a series of online events orientated around the theme of uh, the moving image as subject and practice in American art. So there's a series of talks and tonight we're having an artist interview with Jan Harworth, which revolve around the idea of film, television and other media being a significant area um, for the investigation of many artists in America in the 20th century, both as a subject as something that's explored in non lens based media like painting and sculpture and performance, but also as a type of practice film and television used by different artists and different um, uh, different practitioners throughout the 20th century. So tonight, along with my colleague, Dr. Joe Applin, who I'll introduce here, is uh, who is currently the head of art history at the Courtauld and a fellow researcher in American art after 1960, very much a well-published, well-respected figure in this field with uh, expertise in sculpture and gender representation and feminism and all sorts of questions of American art during the period uh, since 1960. And we'll be uh, delighted to be in conversation with um, Jan Howarth, who is a, an amazing artist who many of you will know. And we'll thank you so much for joining us, Jan, and thank you for joining us everyone to come and speak. Um, we're going to be talking about Jan's work uh, Jan, in the context of film and cinema. So Jan was uh, born in Hollywood in California and she attended North Hollywood High UCLA before leaving for Europe um, in the early 1960s taking an art education at the Slade and partially also at the Courtauld where she studied uh, the history of art and she worked in the UK for about 30 years before returning to America where she's now based in Utah and continues her practice. And um, Jan's known for her role as a real uh, a pioneer of soft sculpture and fabric sculptural assemblages and her relationship to pop art in the 1960s. But what we want to do today through um, speaking with uh, Jan and myself and Joe, having a conversation about the really important role that the moving image in cinema and particularly Hollywood has played in Jan's visual thinking, in her approach to art making and in the idea of different subjects and ways of making art. So we're gonna split this session into two. Uh, in the first part, Joe will speak with Jan about her work during the 1960s and then I will come on uh, after about 25 minutes and we and Jan will speak about uh, her work from the late 90s onward. So this is going to be a sort of quite broad ranging conversation in terms of the scope of the works that we're going to look at, but we're going to really pin down questions of the work's relationship to cinema, both as a subject and as a kind of technique or an idea of cinema, the material nature of it that could be mimicked and thought <laughs> through within works of art. So it's a really fantastic opportunity to have a really great conversation with an artist and I think that I would always like to kick off, and we, as we discussed this previously, I already wanted to kick off with this question, which is, Jan, your work is so uh, tied and undergirded by cinema as a way of thinking and looking, um, and that really comes from the fact that you grew up in Hollywood, and not only did you grow up in the place where movies were made, but you actually had loads of opportunities to visit film sets and to engage with the actual technical processes behind this kind of work. So what I'm going to do is share my screen and we'll start off with an image um, of <coughs> your work in this field and relationship. We're going to start not, sort of, not with an image of your work, sorry, but with an image of the back lot of a set, a, mm -hmm. an image that would be um, familiar to you from your time hanging out on, in such places because of your accompanying your father to work. Your father was a very uh, noteworthy art director and a technician working as a production designer in the Hollywood studio system. So you got to see a lot of this firsthand. So my first question to you would be, what is it that the experience was of going to these places that gave you such a sense of cinema? And how did it impact your visual thinking? Um, if you could begin to answer that. And I'm gonna put up in the background as you speak, some posters of films that your father worked on that you would have visited the sets of uh, to some extent that you told me you had. And it just is amazing to hear some anecdotes <coughs> in relationship to that and how it affected your way of thinking visually. Well, I, I mean, my, my dad, um, I mean, the, the peculiar thing looking back on it now is that you know, I realized that the way he um, introduced me to his work was very unusual in that he really, any film that was made in LA um, and a good many of the ones that were on location, he just took me with him to work. And it never particularly occurred to me that there were no other children, you know, having that experience. But 
<clears throat> it really was unusual from that point of view. And, and also I saw uh, filmmaking uh, from that perspective. In other words, the, the foe of it. Um, mm. And uh, it meant that, you know, every single part of the filmmaking process was open from, you know, cause sometimes they were shooting when, when I was on the soundstage, other times it was the carpenters making the set. Um, and so, uh, you know, that that perspective of filmmaking, um, it, it was such a privilege. I, you know, I just took it as, as my normal or my, you know, my dad's normal life and, um, you know, looked at it from that that perspective of, uh, you know, a seven year old child to, you know, whatever, um, eight, nine, ten, all, all through those years. And um, <clears throat> so, I mean, I think the soundstage itself was you know such a, a fusion of, of different talents you know from the prop man the the uh, costume designer uh, the cameraman the um, the director the writer um, the actors and and the other part that's important to me in in that world is that the the star as such was no more important than the prop man and mm -hmm. and that is a foundation i think too about a, an a, a, a fusion process a process where a lot of people contribute to a single work of art um so it's like the theater it's like opera it's like ballet um all of the arts are fused into one um production and so that's very you know it's, it's, it really does speak to the concept of democracy and um, it undercuts the idea of the star, you know, mm. that that has never impressed me um, and never been a part of the way um, I, I approach this. So, so, I mean, looking at that photograph, which I just find delightful, um, it, I was reminded of the moment that you go on the set, there are all the scents of the scent of the, of the set, which is you know, fiberglass and wet plaster and, you know, the muffled sound because you have black um, soft cloth with uh, stuffing behind it on the walls with big buttons, like a big uh, upholstered settee, but it goes up 30 foot or 40 foot. Mm -hmm. um, so there's this, this, I don't know, this wonderful confusion and, and pretense, you know, to the whole uh, experience. And, and I, as I say, it was it was normal for me, but um, you know, looking back on it, it seems that, you know very peculiar. Yes, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> amazing. Um, I just put up a couple of uh, images here of films that your uh, dad did work on. He worked with Hitchcock on a couple of occasions, and we spoke about that briefly before. I know that, but it's, it's just interesting that, that so many of the actual works that you would have been exposed to would have been quite high octane genre films and like action and and suspense yeah. dramas. That it was kind of like a a whirlwind tour of like what was going on in the Hollywood at the time that he, yeah. he traversed all sorts of different genres and he traversed the, the, the real gamut of what was available and I know that um, Invasion of the Body Snatchers is something that you had fond and keen memories of exploring the background of and the, the behind the scenes. Yeah and I you know I think I mean the the thing now because it's so long ago I mean I rode on the merry-go-round in uh, that was used in Strangers on a Train and you know, um, that was fun. And it was just pre there shooting that that amazing scene. Um, and I think, you know, the uh, things with the body snatchers and so forth. I mean, it was it was really close in because, um, you know, my father would come home and say, Augie Lohman is having a terrible time with this, um, this pod, you know, he wants to have something and he's not quite sure what it is. And you know all about, uh, you know, seed pods and chrysalises. I was an avid butterfly collector. And so, you know, we made a pod over the weekend, you know, so, I mean, it's a, a bit of a long story probably for our chat today, but, yeah. but that, you know, that idea of a faux person seeing, um, you know, Dana, uh, Dana uh, Winters and um, Kevin McCarthy, um, you know, in rubber, you know, mm -hmm. in, the, in the plaster shop. I mean, it's directly related to work I've, I've done that is why some of my work is white because of the plaster shop. And, you know, I did do um, latex figures later on for films for my dad and also uh, in my in my actual work that the Betjeman Bears and various other things had had latex faces. Um, so it's directly related, um, you know, to that kind of um, uh, trick world trickery, you know, yeah. making make creating an illusion. Um, yeah. The Body Snatchers is a very seminal film because it questions so many things, and I I could you know 
talk for an <laughs> hour. <laughs> we a lot of time protecting, I think. It's a vast, fascinating movie. I think it would be great if we went on to look at some of your work in relation to this, because I think that the idea that it fed, fed your uh, practical knowledge of how to make things as well at the same mm -hmm. time, and it was feeding yeah. back and forth between your training as an artist and your practice and how you actually ended up working on uh, pieces and props for your mm -hmm. father it, within the context but also how that influenced your fine art practice is a really fascinating thing that we can get into and I'll yeah. hand over to Joe and we can start going into some of the work that was being made in this immediate period after these experiences in Hollywood in the mid to late 50s and we can start talking about the early 60s work and how that um, is in conversation perhaps with some of these ideas. Thanks, Tom. Um, Dan, I always learn something new every time uh, you uh, talk about your work. So we've been talking about your earlier soft sculpture very much in terms of, you know, you're having been trained by your grandmother and I think your mum too in stress making and these kind of crafts and these skills um, that making a large soft sculpture entails. But you're talking now about them in terms of plaster and other kinds of materials and the kind of the stuff of the of the film set. And this is absolutely fascinating. So um, Rodeo Cowboy White, because of the, the plaster that you remember, that wet plaster um, mm -hmm. from the film set. So um, if you could just briefly, could you just introduce it? So you come to London, you're a young art student, you think you're coming for a year taking a year out or so from your art studies at UCLA. Um, so you wind up taking some courses at the Slade, some at the Courtauld, you eventually enroll, or quite quickly, I think, as a full registered student at the Slade in the painting studio. Mm -hmm. But you quickly discover, while riding the bus through Knightsbridge, <laughs> that <laughs> perhaps what you're going to do is make an enormous kind of cast, right, of soft figures, which leads us to uh, these earlier figures, the Rodeo Cowboy, we've got the surfer as well. So could you just, just give us this narrative of how, how you come to make these extraordinary figures um, at this time? Yeah, I, um, I originally actually, to just roll back a little bit, I was in the sculpture department in Reg Butler's kind of um, maverick studio that you could get into at 7.30 in the morning because it, the window was unlocked. Um, and it, you know, it meant that I could start when I was used to starting, um, which was, you know, at UCLA, you had your first class at 7.30. Um, so, you know, so I was an early start. Um, but, um, and then I transferred up to what was known as the landing in the Slade. And the landing was where everybody who was kind of um, belligerent and um, rebelling was. Um, we were sort of making a statement that we weren't necessarily going to be found in the life classes or the the cast room or you know, drawing still lives. So, um, you know, that that just sort of happened early on. Um, and I was principally working in two dimensions at the Slade, um, although I was beginning to introduce things like pottery um, to my paintings. Um, I, I painted a, a wardrobe uh, that ha had wooden clothes hanging in the wardrobe. And um, I, I, you know, I decided I was going to be doing some flowers. I thought, well, I'll do a, either a painting of flowers or something like that. And I, I just finished a, a very large scale typewriter um, that I'd, I'd done a painting of. Um, and um, while riding the bus home, I, you know, I was thinking, well, how, how shall I do these flowers? Shall I do them in plaster or in cloth or something? I was pretty sure they needed to be three dimensional. Um, and uh, it, it occurred to me that none of that felt right. It didn't feel like flowers. And I, what I identified was that I wanted the flowers to feel soft and warm and yielding. And, and it just, the penny just dropped, you know, that they should be in cloth. And that just, and then it just took off. I mean, this is between, um, you know, Hyde Park, corner, it's Hyde Park corner? No, um, whatever it is around uh, Wellington's house and um, mm -hmm. Harrods and then South Kensington um, <clears throat> on the bus, on the number 30 bus. And I was just, you know, it seemed to me that, that not only did I have the language of turning two dimensional um, pieces of fabric into three dimensional form, I actually knew anatomy um, because of, I knew the shape of an arm uh, from pattern making. And I'd made all my clothes from probably the age of, I started sewing when I was eight and my clothes would have been mostly made by me by 11, 10, 11. And um, so that, 
concept of two dimensions to three dimensions was really obvious to me. And I knew it was a, a, a form of making that wasn't available or as available to young men. And, you know, being reasonably a lot competitive, I thought, you know, I've, I've got something they haven't got and I can do this. Um, so the idea of the, the flowers was that, that gloves could be a flower or that if you wanted to make a snapdragon, perhaps a snapdragon had a zip mouth on it. Um, and uh, so each thing kind of produced the next thing that I thought, well, I'll make a dog to go with the flowers and no, make an old lady to go with the flowers and a dog to go with the old lady. And by the time I got to my, my bus stop, it was like I was so impatient for the next five years to be accomplished because I had just a head full of, of things I was about to make. Um, so that that was the kind of genesis point, you know, as you know, my my, you know, 1962 um, entry. <laughs> so yeah. And so thanks. So interesting. So this cast of characters that you conjure um, on the bus includes, so as you've mentioned, the old ladies, the dog, these very early works, 62, 63, but, but they're all kind of types, aren't they? Um, the surfer, the cowboy. So can you, uh, do you recall how you came up with this um, selection? I mean, they don't all belong together. You do have a trio of, you have the dog and you have the two old ladies and the old man, Frank. So, I mean, we can talk about perhaps how you, how they're displayed because you're clear they're not a kind of, in, they're not, this is not part of a conversation to do with installation art for you. The setting of these figures is absolutely recalling that of the, of the, of the set. Yeah, I mean, there, you know, the connecting point to the first part of your question is that, um, you know, they um, all were autobiographical. I felt I was catching up on my story. I had no way to express my, my past um, before, and suddenly I did. I had an original path to walk down. And, um, and so the idea was to catch up on myself. So the charm bracelet was catching up on my past, you know, the holidays that I took with my parents. And um, the, um, the surfer was something that was the idol of, of California, you know, the California beach, the sun bleached hair of the surfer with the calluses on his knees, you know, that was, that was the, the god of, of, of the beaches. Um, and uh, I had been to Texas and seen ro rodeo cowboys um, and, um, you know, their very laid back, you know, look of the modern cowboy, really someone with very little to do except maybe ranch work uh, wasn't the same as the, the, the movie cowboy. Um, and the expertise of the, the rodeo cowboy was a whole different uh, zone. Um, and so, so these things were all tied to autobiographical work, if you like. As far as the display was concerned, I wanted all the figures to be A, comfortable, so they didn't look like they were halfway through a motion or something like that, so that they were at rest. Um, they were in a, a natural position. Um, the, the surfer is a little awkward. I mean, he's a little bit stiff, <laughs> but um, anyway, but, but that was the point, that they were in a relaxed pose. That meant that it did work that kind of sort of trick of the movie that you come in and, oh, you think it's a figure. It'll, it'll distract you even when it's a very surrealistic one like the old woman. So um, it, it was something where I felt that the display was really part of this because it was a relationship with the viewer. Um, it was also a relationship with fine art in that these were objects in the world. They were not on pedestals. That was really important to me. They weren't separated from the home, that the old lady belongs in a house um, or that the, um, the flowers are on a table in a house. So it's in a context. And to that point, the first you know, exhibition after the young contemporaries um, <clears throat> first painting that I got into that um, I showed at the ICA in 1963 and I made an actual set for for the figures so in other words they were in a context um, that was um, not real um, but it was you know the ideal context for those objects the donuts and the china cabinet and um, those things so so the the idea of the positioning relative to the viewer and the um, also the idea of you know what the the business of these these figures was supposed to be and as i say it cuts back to experiences of mine personally that's what artists do um and um you know tries to tie tries to catch up with my my past to get me to my present so yeah 
That's so interesting. That, and just on the theme of trickery, Tom, can you just flip back quickly to the cowboy and to the, the surfer that there's a trickery here is that it, they're not just soft, that you, in order to have them freestanding and that wonderful slouch to the rodeo cowboy, they're actually supported with wood. You kind of put these wooden um, um, sections and so you've kind of wrapped, the, you've made these amazing abs for the surfer, you've described those in detail. But that slouch to the cowboy, and if anyone was lucky enough to see your show at Pallant House, um, in the midst of pre-COVID times, was it two years ago now, um, to encounter that figure kind of slouching against the wall. I mean, it's quite, it's quite something that stillness is, um, it's, they're remarkable figures for the way they can sort of hold their space, I think. And so there is a kind of old fashioned trickery here to how are you going to make these things stand up, right? Um, which I think is, so yeah. I see this kind of amazingly <laughs> sea skinned <laughs> well, surface. Yeah. You can see that. I think armature is the devil sculptors forever. I mean, I, I took the view that I would make a wooden skeleton with, you know, wing nuts on the knees and in the hips and stuff. And it's, it's you know, it's, you're, you're really <laughs> writing a, a, a long story of work because I have to go into the sculpture and tighten up the wing nut, you know, this sort of thing. It, yeah, um, I, I would have got in trouble with the with the people who uh, insisted that your armatures were absolutely, you know, never going to move ever again. And of course, I wanted to have the cowboy sit down if he wanted to, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, so let's say, so, Tom, can you flip on to May May West? She's made it. She's made an appearance. So let's turn our attention to this. This is in the collection of Pant House. An amazing, amazing object. It is entirely um, unique. Um, in its operations and what it looks like. Um, I wonder how clear it is to understand if you haven't seen this to understand what we're looking at here, which is a kind of a deep uh, box with well Jen can you explain this to us because yeah, you also um, introduced me to the idea of what it is to be faced with this work as a viewer <laughs> yeah <laughs> um it, it this is um the the kind of full restoration of this piece um when Sandy Wilson and uh, MJ bought it um they decided to case it and which meant they had to turn off the um the the lights um because it would have melted the case um or caught on fire or something but now with LEDs we can have it lit again which I'm so thrilled about and Pallant House has done that restoration. Um, so the idea here was to do a bas relief Mae West. Um, she's not three dimensional, she's just slightly um, in relief. Um, and she's in a case that's a, maybe 15 inches deep. Um, and it's um, meant to be a dressing table. So it's the, the regard of a woman of a woman, basically she's looking at herself. Um, and um, the, the idea is that it's a faux mirror. I've always loved playing around with lights. I used to um, make lamps for my, my family for Christmas and there's something about lights that just dazzle me. Um, anyway, so I wanted to make a, a dressing table and I wanted the glass that would be the mirror to just be glass and put double objects so that it looks like it's a reflection um, because everything's double. So you kind of, for a moment, it's like, wait, what, what is, what's going on here? Um, and basically it's supposed to be hung low and there's supposed to be a little stool in front of it so that you, you sit down to look at it and you take the place, you're a stand-in for Mae West herself. And the odd thing that happened coincidentally, I have to confess it was not governed. Um, you know, coincidentally, when I sat down, my eyes lined up with hers and it looked like she was blinking, which was <laughs> really quite, quite disturbing. Um, and I think they caught that on, on camera, a, a film that uh, John Reed did uh, that was narrated by Robert Melville. Um, anyway, it, it's, it, you know, it's a, it's a work that, pleases me entirely that, you know, it's, it's kind of um, very contained, very definite. Um, you know, it, it has this an, an initial trick of the, the mirror. And I love the fact that it's sort of duplicitous, you know, that you can't kind of figure it out. You can't lay it to rest, really. You just keep playing with it. Um, you know, what's going on? Why is that working? What is, you know, what is this about? Um, and um, so Mae West was my choice as, you know, if you like fan art, because because she was not beautiful. She was not in the, the regular constraints for a woman. And yet when she came on the screen, she dazzled you. Um, she did not have a beautiful body. You know, she was, you know, an older woman, kind of middle-aged almost, um, uh, by the time she was really at her zenith. 
Um, so she broke, she broke through basically. Uh, it would have been completely un, I would have never done Marilyn Monroe. I mean, she was too beautiful for a start. Why would I do that? Why would I reproduce her? Um, it, I had no interest in that kind of territory. Um, so, um, you know, it, it, whereas Mae West fascinated me. And as a PS to that, my, my father um, survived um, delivering um, her fur coats from Magnons when he was in high school. <laughs> Which I, I wish I could have been a fly on the wall at that moment because he's pretty cute. You know, he sort of starred in a production at his high school. So. <laughs> I think that the idea that she's such a character as well, and I think I sent you some of these photos. I was I'm looking into this work a while ago, and I stumbled upon one of these Hollywood auction sites, and it was auctioning various um, property of Lucille Ball. Marilyn Monroe and Mae West and there was so many I mean it just looked like this the the uh, vanity um, table with the brush and the mirror and so on I mean extraordinary the idea of this being fan art there it was for sale in, in slightly ghoulish um, the things that were available hair pieces and so on but I think this idea of it being kind of like an homage to this uh, to this woman as a character is um, yeah. is, is extraordinary and we do have another photograph um, I think of you with, with kind of performing what it would be to sit at the lower so this is it yeah. before it's been installed in that box obviously this is how yeah. this is yeah yeah, yeah. so and this yeah is and, yeah and I, I think too that that one must remember that Mae West wrote scripts I mean she she wasn't just in front of the camera she actually wrote it you know wrote the scripts and at that time of course that would have been unusual but then again there were many many women at that time that were you know absolutely strutting their stuff in a very you know formal and aggressive way I mean we tend to talk about you know what is not there but we forget that you know these amazing women in the 20s and 30s were just you know I mean they were dynamic and they were at the front of things they weren't held down and certainly they were much more than just eye candy um, in the films they appeared in and the life lives that they led I mean you know so it's uh, we, we must we must remember that that we don't always need to talk about what wasn't there I mean you know these these were dynamic women of accomplishment and certainly the theater from the 1800s onwards was a great liberation for women and the ballet, you know, in France, you know, that women, you know, the daughters of washerwomen became ballerinas. Yes, they had a really hard life probably after, but the, the thing is that women were in on the rise being, you know, independent and accomplishing things. Um, my great grandmother was a seamstress, her house burnt to the ground. She had to start again with two children. Her husband was dead, you know, so, I mean, you know, women were there and, you know, you know, absolutely taking the reins of their lives, um, you know, perhaps uh, more earlier than we give them credit for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And this makes that so visible here. Um, it's just, I mean, if you to be kind of a young American woman in London at this time, in the midst of a kind of a burgeoning art world pop scene that is absolutely in full to, um, to America, to pop, to the kind of popular culture, I think is, is also an extraordinary aspect of this work, you know, the surfer and so on. She's not a familiar figure on the uh, UK visual landscape. So I think that your bringing of these kind of archetypes is also something that um, needs thinking about too. Um, to Tom, we're, of course, we're rambling away, uh, running through time. We can have a couple more here. And also I want to talk about props because I think that we need to think about scale and, and some of your larger objects too. But before we do, we have this other wonderful bar relief here. Um, do you, uh, do you have anything you'd like to say other than us to enjoy this? It's sure, really just, just just quickly, it's um, it's now uh, the Tate owns this piece and um, it's a sort of three quarter life. It's just under life size. Most everything I do is life size because I want, it, you know, the sculpture to, you know, occupy the same world as you do. I don't want to do a, a sculpture of something. I want to do the thing that it is. So that takes us to the idea of both the, the prop and the stand in and, and those kinds of things. But but this particular piece, I <laughs> I. I just imagine the horror that each person here would feel if this was a Hollywood family, because uh, I mean, W.C. Fields 
loathed um, children and Mae West certainly wasn't the motherly type and they Mae West and W.C. Fields rowed on way out west continually so the idea of this juxtaposition really pleased me um, and um, you know I adore W.C. Fields I mean I, it, it, I just love you know the whole nature of his you know misanthropic view of life <laughs> so uh, I have a pretty dark sense of humor I guess but anyway you know that 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 group um, to me was just such a, a wonderful, delightful you know, kind of catastrophe. <laughs> Amazing, completely. And this is done through stitching, right? You're sewing this, uh, that's done yes. through, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. So that's that's all hand stitched, except probably the floor that you're seeing that slight arc, that probably was mm -hmm. sewn on the machine. Um, yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. Um, Tom, what did you have up for us next? Yes, the, the snake lady. Um, I don't know if she's still on show. I last saw her not very long ago. I think maybe in November, just before we were locked down again in, in London, um, in, in your current show at Gazelli, which also contains much more, many more recent works, which you're going to be talking about shortly with Tom. But um, does, does, does snake lady have a connection to, to, I mean, there's certainly something cinematic about this figure. Um, well, I, I was interested, there was a sort of transition at the end of the 60s when um, I think we were all um, indulging more in kind of uh, fantasy literature. I was very interested in E.R. Edison's book, um, Worm of Ouroboros and the Mistress of Mistresses, and that zone of writing uh, appealed to me. There were many, many brilliant British and American writers that, um, you know, occupied a, a literary zone. Um, plus the fact that I grew up with, I mean, my, my mother read to me quite a lot and she read a lot of the Greek um, uh, tales. And um, so I was familiar with Medusa and, and you know, various, um, you know, Pandora and so forth. And Medusa just fascinated me. Um, I, before we opened today, I was just saying to Tom that, um, you know, she she actually started with her shoes. I, I was down Portobello Road and saw these platform snakeskin shoes. And I'd been thinking about doing a, a Medusa figure. And um, so it, it, it rose like Galatia from the feet up. And Galatia is certainly a, a reoccurring theme in the work I do. Um, but, um, you know, so it was that, but also combined with the kind of uh, oddity of, of we knew that snakes change shape when they swallow something so she's kind of inside the snake as well as um her head being you know snake locks um and her her head is coming her face her ceramic face is coming out of the mouth of the snake um and uh it's vinyl uh so this was one of the well the second time i used vinyl um which was another kind of forbidden um material which i thought would be interesting to kind of um you know investigate um I, there was a wonderful shop that had all this amazing vinyl it's called b and g leather goods and that was in near near um portland place or something um and um so you know that became a kind of stimulus um also i i was beginning to be frustrated with making sewn faces because they weren't detailed enough uh, that i couldn't really get the the edge of an eyelid or the that little crest that happens on the upper lip um, and so the idea of turning to ceramics, my mother had been a ceramicist for many years. I, I literally grew up eating clay. My aunt said that when my mother was practicing the piano, she would hand me clay to keep me quiet when I was sort of 18 months and I would just sit there and chow down on it. Um, and so, you know, clay was something I was very familiar with. Um, and um, uh, so working with clay and doing something three-dimensional with clay appealed to me, plus the fact at that time I was collecting dolls. So there was this kind of uh, preset um, uh, uh, conceit that you had a China head, uh, China hands and feet, and um, that was a doll. Um, so it kind of had a prequel. And I, I am still in love with terracotta clay. So she's terracotta as well as the uh, sorceress that I did at this time. For me, they're very, the fantasy, you know, kind of gets old. Um, it's a little bit too um, detailed in a way that I, I now mo have moved away from. But, um, you know, at the, 
at the period it was done, sort of late 60s, um, it was very much on the kind of tone of the time of, you know, the hippie look and the very much more ornate um, uh, expression of things. I, I think of it as, you know, artists naturally go from very simple ideas to Rococo and then they recover from Rococo and go back to simple, you know, so it's, a, you know, little arcs of, of um, practice. Yeah. Well, I think she certainly reaches the peak of that. I think it's an absolutely extraordinary <laughs> uh, Baroque figure. Um, so let's, can we just briefly, perhaps we should, so we've talked a little about these, but maybe the larger than the large scaled, we've got the charm bracelet and the jewels and ring. And I wondered if, it, if you could talk a little about this, we've been thinking about props and sets and the kind of memories mm -hmm. attached to these. And this might be a nice moment because I'm very eager then to hand it back over to Tom to talk about your more recent work and its kind of intersections yeah. with the cinema. Yeah. Well, I, I referred to the charm bracelet earlier, and mm -hmm. um, the the idea of large scale for me did not come from Oldenburg. We were doing this stuff at the same time, um, and uh, the white I've suggested, you know, the idea of things being made in latex or um, um, the plaster shop, that kind of thing. But large scale for me was directly related to the fact of uh, my father made sets for various things. And one of the things that he worked on was a, a film with Gene Kelly, where Gene Kelly had to be a little miniature man. And so my dad did a great big telephone and a great big pencil. And that had occurred at other times. He'd done things that, that changed the scale of the actor. Um, and so the idea of large then throws the, uh, the viewer into a position of being miniature. Um, in other words, you suddenly are Alice, you shrink down and this giant charm bracelet is in front of you. Um, it, there's a practical thing there as well, which is that I couldn't very well make a cloth um, uh, you know, charm bracelet the size that it actually is. Plus the fact that I found it very humorous, the idea of making a, a chain out of out of fabric, like a big donut, you know, di donuts linked together. And when when an idea strikes you like this, it's just so exciting. You think, oh, you know, I could do that. I could make this ridiculous charm bracelet with these puffy, like Mickey Mouse hand, um, you know, uh, charms and, you know, this crazy chain, you know, that's made out of cloth. How cool. Um, so that is the kind of notion behind, behind that sort of thing. But the, the remaking of this particular bracelet really, again, is autobiographical because it is each charm represents a different holiday that I had with my um, father and my stepmother or my mom and my stepdad. So it was, it was to, um, you know, to, to pay attention, to have a memory of that camping trip or that fishing trip or um, going to Kentucky or um, something like that. So, so it, it's actually like a comic strip, it's a timeline and it's like a sequential a narrative. Um, and I've, I've done about five or six um, charm bracelets uh, along this topic. So. Mm -hmm. so there's something kind of like this kind of cinematic series of stills that you kind of thread together yes. to kind of narrate a life, which I think is really uh, is a beautiful way of thinking about these that, as you say, puts them in a com in completely different conversation to those that we tend to have around soft sculpture at this time. I think that this cinematic angle is, um, is something that's really quite unique um, to what you're doing here. So I think we can see another, is that another bracelet on the wall behind as well as we have the- Yes, the ring here. yeah, that's that's the um, French charm bracelet in the background that now is in the um, BYU collection, uh, uh, their uh, mm -hmm. Museum of Art. And uh, yeah, that was one I did um, post 2000. So in other words, another kind of prop idiom. There's a, what you can see there is the tear, um, the red tear. Um, I, well, I made it red. Um, Picasso, when he did Guernica, he was going to put a tear on the painting and he had a little tear that he had a thumbtack um, that he kept putting it in different places. Um, and so I wanted to kind of highlight that. So it's a cigarette box. He kept the tear in the cigarette uh, matchbox. Um, and uh, so I wanted to uh, review that. That's the French charm bracelet, so it's all things about France. And in the foreground is um, the ring and um, uh, rhinestones. And uh, the idea there was just I suddenly realized that a quilt pattern, i.e. the geometric patterns of a quilt, could be made three-dimensional if you changed the angles. And um, so the idea of doing um, jewels just fascinated me. So I thought that that would be a, an amazing thing to do. And then the ring came uh, as a part of that set. Thank you so much. Um, Jan, fascinating. Well, I'm going to hand you over to Tom now. I think we're going to take a bit of a leap um, to the more recent work. So 
yeah a little bit thanks um, so much that was just so so, yeah. so so interesting it's so good to hear about linking like you said it's kind of really disrupting a kind of narrative of what we think of when we think of this type of sculpture and the media that was being used at the time um I, as joe says jam we're going to jump uh, a, a, a few years and uh, we're going to move into some work which is perhaps I, I I don't know if it's a correct way to describe it. It's, it's slightly more abstracted way of thinking about cinema. Something that's much more to do with the techniques of cinema and how they might be translated into uh, static works of art. Thinking about things like the celluloid strip. Thinking about things like frames, framing, and the idea of projections of light and shadow. And I think that. Uh, some of your work from the late 1990s onwards really d drills down into thinking about these as sort of like problems of aesthetics and problems for vision that can be yeah. interrogated um, within your practice. So I would like to jump through a few different uh, works from this period onwards. So I don't want to start with a couple of works that this work that we've been using in all the advertisement that, that is a great um, pa painting of yours. Um, and this is from a, a number of works that have to take their titles directly from films um, and all engage with the celluloid strip um, in one way or another, either as a painted form or as something that's actually affixed to the canvas and used um, in, in, as, as a sort of like three dimensional object that becomes a part of the work in a work like Pleasantville. So I'll just go back to the first work and I just wanted to ask about what you what it is for you that is to do with the, the film the film strip what, what why is it that you came to this become an idiom that you began to ruminate on in some ways and what it what it has to do with um this broader idea of stitching and editing and bringing things together i know that's something that um, yeah. is of interest to you yeah i i'll back up a little bit to the mid 90s that i began to feel that i I did a show with Rene Gimple um, for Gimple Fee that was actually a storyboard. Um, it was a series of paintings that all went together with links in between that were like little cuts or little um, close-ups. And um, I heard on the radio when I knew I was coming uh, back to um, America for a fellowship, the Robert Fraser Fellowship, um, that um, I would be in the mountains in Sundance and so forth. And there was an interview with Robert Hughes and where he said, um, artists, in order to renew themselves, need to return to the wilderness. And I, I took that not as meaning that you literally had to go to the wilderness. I was actually literally going to the wilderness, but but he would mean you could probably find a wilderness in New York City, I'm sure. Um, so um, the renewal idea was certainly something that, you know, I was ready for because I had this notion that what I wanted to do was to find a way of fusing um, the graphic novel, the comic book, the storyboard, with the patchwork quilt. Um, and I hadn't devised the methodology. That was the form that I wanted. And I knew I wanted to revisit the landscape, the nude, the, the, the still life, um, and the portrait. And I thought, if I had this new, f if I could fuse these things, then I could revisit those, those cardinal concerns of fine art, um, and perhaps produce something you know new or fresh and um so so the idea was to kind of somehow stumble my way into that and the first kind of breakthrough that i had was to think okay so i can stitch i can you know edit i can put together these this idea of doing a strip that's fairly abstract that's not a literal movie strip i'd just been to ucla when we first came back here and i'd seen a whole bunch of clips on the wall that were held by bulldog clips um and lot on the floor and they were these beautiful strips of film that had been cut out of literal film before everything went digital and I thought, well, that's just such a beautiful thing. And it's exactly like a comic book and it's exactly like a quilt. Um, and so there are these squares that are pieced together and cut up like with scissors. Um, so like fabric. Um, so I set about that idea and I made a whole bunch of paintings that um, you know had this film strip notion in it with the, the film strip, actually the little frames being very abstracted. And then I decided to turn that to particular films. So I did Ghost World, Pleasantville um, and uh, Cinema Paradiso. I think this one's probably the most successful of that lot. Um, and it's in a, a private collection in, in Boston now. Um, and I, uh, this painting is a painting I really love. I, it, it sort of has everything it needs to have in a way that sometimes you do a work that, that works on a lot of levels for you and this one does. Um, it, it, it is the bits of film in Cinema Paradiso, the, the priest in the story takes all the kisses out of the film. 
<laughs> and I love the idea that all the kisses are on the wall of the projection room. Um, so the black hole is the proje projection hole and it, it happened to have this beautiful little bit of red um, in the actual set itself. So this is actually the, the you know, a, a shot from the film as it were, um, only um, of course it's interpreted with color. Um, and um, so the idea there is, is really to present the whole problem to say, okay, it's film, it's storyboard, it's, um, it's actually a work of art. It's you know representing a still life that is a different kind of still life. The cinema is so beautiful because you know the, the cinema frame, one frame in a film is a still life. It's a moment of time that's frozen. Um, and yeah, it doesn't have an apple or an orange in it, but in, actually in Cinema Paradiso, there are some shots of lemons, um, but it's, and they're represented in that. Um, but it, it is, it's that wonderful kind of, when you hit a place where a whole bunch of roads come together, um, that, that is, that's the, was the objective. And that was, you know, the return to the wilderness and Sundance, um, for me. Um, so yeah. And, and yeah. Sundance, of course, bookends the Hollywood experience because it is contemporary film. Uh, you know, it is a documentary film, the kind of genesis of things for the Sundance festival and the work that Robert Fred Redford has done in terms of the film industry. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's a, I think that's a really interesting point to draw them two together as a sort of like the stuff that's happening at Sundance now is something yeah. that wasn't yeah. happening in old Hollywood. It's is much more of a new yeah. world. And this this kind of work really yeah. surmises what also like mm -hmm. a, it was to be a, a thinking about what images were permissible or permitted as well in some sense. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I, I also took from that that trio of work, um, the, the, the Pleasantville, which does something slightly different, which has the frame, uh, the celluloid, or the, the 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 material equivalent to celluloid spill out beyond the frame and it contains yeah. within it much more of a varied series of reference from graffiti to abstract expressionism to different um signifiers and signs and i wondered if you could help us unpack what what, what was going on with pleasantville slightly well it i mean pleasantville is just a brilliant film that's the first thing to give kudos to that film um and I wanted to do an American flag that was a protest to the um, uh, events that uh, were taking place in the Bush government. I did a lot of um, political work at that time. <clears throat> and uh, this particular one is, um, it, you know, the idea is that it's a, a kind of um, changed American flag. And the things that are running horizontally across the screen are all different kinds of protest. So there's a, a, a strip that is Guernica, um, there's graffiti, there's ad busters uh, covers, um, uh, the magazine ad busters, mm -hmm. um, and um, early graffiti work uh, by scene. And um, uh, I can't think of what the other one was, Dondi, I think. Um, and uh, then the uh, yellow, the book, uh, Yellow Wallpaper is referenced there, the, that yellow strip at the bottom uh, by uh, Charlotte Gilmore Perkins. Um, Perkins Gilmore? Well. Mm -hmm. either way um and um so and then abstract expressionism is is a little bit of a stretch but um and then dada at the top the mertz reference um so um it it's it's about protest it's about standing you know against or you know in support of something um and so the film strips are as if kind of newsreel or um you know accounts of protest and so forth and of course um, you mentioned it earlier something about um uh, uh, looking through the lens that the the work that is um you know the, the cinema is working through the lens <clears throat> um i think actually artists have become increasingly tied to the lens themselves in terms of reproducing things in other words we're taking photographs of stuff or we're um you know using the camera uh, increasingly and certainly now with the internet um the 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 support of if I want to see Mae West in profile or if I want to see you know a particular uh, shot of um, a, 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 I don't know a wheelchair which I'm drawing right now um, then I, I can get that like that and of course that didn't exist going back <laughs> you know we don't have to go back very far where that wasn't available so I think art and artists are um, it, it profoundly connected to the lens now they they have been in different ways at different times but I think it it really is, um, you know, again, those two those two zones are actually approaching and we see a lot more artists making films because, you know, the the camera is so available to everyone. Um, oh. Yeah, definitely. I think it's really interesting to point out that idea that this is a kind of way of 
using cinema or cinema technologies or the sort of mechanics of the image to reframe arts histories or to think yeah. through the impact of, of it socio-politically of different ways of thinking visually, but using cinema as a way to yeah. frame that in that sort of immediate documentary sense is really an interesting metaphor. And I think it's something that's picked up on the idea of using frames at least to figure a relation between the cinema and to modernism yeah. and to modernist collage in particular is something that I think we see in the yeah. um, works there, that especially the um, Dreaming Painters series, which I'll show the Picasso uh, version here and then just just to give us context of the fact that this is one from a number in the series, this is them all hung together. And each of the artists that you're dealing with were very much associated with collage in their own practice. And they all had this sense or idea of the body existing in fragments, fragmentary perspectives on um, the human. And what th that to me, you really bring to, bring to the fore that core relation between the cinema as fragmentary experience as a modernist vision and collage being in sort of tune with one another in that relation. I just, I think this series is so fascinating to think about the idea of frames and fracturing. Um, yeah. And it's just something I would be great if we could hear you speak about how these works came to be, and especially the Picasso, because it's got both also the celluloid frames within its, um, within its structures as well. Yeah, uh, the, the Dreaming Painters came out of an idea that um, if these deceased painters were dreaming, um, they would see shards of their paintings. So the idea of the shard, and I'm never, do you say sherds in England? Anyway, sherds or shards, um, um, you know, are again, they're little pieces. And of course, and I, I tend to think sequentially. Um, so so I, I put a logical order together in terms of what I'm, the, the underpinning of a work of art. I'm not an intuitive artist that goes in there and um, I'm faced with a canvas and I paint and the, the painting itself generates the next mark making of the thing. I, I quite consciously approach it in a way that I know what it's going to be. And I do leave a certain amount for, you know, the the moment of putting it together or to paint be painting it or something, but but I I absolutely am determined where that stopping stopping point is and it's really pre-planned. Um, mm -hmm. So with the Picasso painting, um, this was the first time that I really started sewing curves together. Um, there's a little bit on um, on the uh, Cinema Paradiso, and I didn't know if that would work because I'm sewing. Um, vinyl and different canvases, different materials, uh, a canvas that has paint on, <clears throat> and each of them would have a different quality of stretching. And it's very important to me that these are stretched perfectly, that there are no ripples in them. So the actual uh, making of these, I didn't know when I made this one, if it, once I'd done all the sewing, whether when I put it on the frame, it, uh, the stretchers, whether it would stretch flat, it might've just been a, something I had, I had to toss in the, the trash can. So it's, a, it's much more more uh, involved series of curves. And so what you're seeing here is both natural canvas that has had rabbit skin glue on it and painted canvas that is done separately. So I paint the canvas um, and then uh, cut it up and then assemble it. And the I have made a pattern from a drawing um, so that each seam has to be accurate to a 16th of an inch, otherwise it won't stretch flat. Um, so, you know, everything is meticulous in terms of where it stops and where it starts. And so all of these are separate pieces. They're not um, painted as it were, um, mm -hmm. except for the film strips, those, those are painted strips. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea of cutting and piecing and going back to that, that sequential um, narrative, it's very much a part of the, the, the mental process that I go through, that you go from this to this, is that logical? No, go back. Um, is, does this feel right for the subject? No, go back. You know, mm -hmm. so it's, it's that process is exactly the same as, as the kind of rhythm that you establish when you're cutting a film. You know, that you are cutting this film and you're saying, we need this close up to be beat, 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 cut. Um, so it's it's absolutely parallel kind of um, you know orchestration of how the mind works in terms of perception um, mm. and um, accruing uh, a, an image or a story. Um, and of course, we're not supposed to tell stories in paintings, um, or at least that was the thinking in the '60s. And um, you know, so I think a, that you have a more concentrated 
image moment with a painting, whereas you have narrative with film. So it's a different, mm -hmm. um, a different storyline. Yeah, yeah the, I, that's it's, it's, that's a really a good point. I think that one of the ones. So just to go through a couple of the other works in terms of on the far right hand side we have Lee Krasner, um, mm -hmm. and then on the far left hand side we have Hannah Hoch, and then next to her um, on a second in from the left is the the one with the body that seems to be quite fragmented. The one that looks most like a sort of conventional window pane, I suppose, split into four quadrants. Is Ray Johnson drowning? Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So that one. That one has kind of a very specific narrative attached to it, I suppose, as well, which is quite interesting too. Yeah. Uh, I, the, yeah. The, the thing too here was that that it was important to me to actually enter the process that these individual painters had um, to extend my own knowledge, and it was very much like when we were students at the Slade. Um, uh, students would be sent to the National Gallery to sit in front of a painting and copy it so that you had to really understand the color, the space, the creation of that work of art. <clears throat> and I always managed to escape that, that, that feat at the slide. <laughs> and, um, but I must say that doing these six paintings, uh, there are three women and three men, um, uh, you know, I really learned so much about the craft of doing this with vinyl, with stitching, with, with layering canvas so that I could make the representation of uh, Ray Johnson's cardboard. Um, so I layered, you know, uh, canvas with glue and then painted these little nuggets that were like his painting. And by diving deeply into the work of these people, um, I, I didn't choose them as I, that I didn't know they all were collage artists. I didn't know Lee Krasner did collages. And there's this wonderful story of the fact that she tore up, um, you know, drawings of her own and um, of uh, Jackson Pollock um, after he died and made these collages. And I think they are the most stunning works of, of her career. Um, they're incredible. And there is a, another story of her drawing in the studio with a house, is it Hussman? I always forget who it was, it was a teacher. Um, and he comes around looking at the students drawing the life model, takes her drawing, quarters it, tears it in half and throws it on the floor and says, that's art. So that's why that one is quartered. And the mm -hmm. the interchange between Lee Krasner and this this German tutor, you know, is it, to me is like, well, there's a moment for you, you know, how dare he quarter her picture, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, anyway. that's amazing. <clears throat> that's amazing. Um, one of the things I mean, this this links into how we were coming to. Um, with the next set of works, the idea of the layering when you're talking about the layering of the canvas and the vinyl and the, the, the fact that they actually generate an effect, which is quite hard to approximate when we're looking at this as yeah. a digital image on a screen. But many of the works that you went on to make after this series are, are very much concerned with this idea of being um, reliefs, but have a three dimensional aspect to them uh, in terms of we'll be also able to see through them and see the fact that they cast mm -hmm. shadows and images and they often play around with the idea of apertures and lenses in a kind of quite direct way and the, mm -hmm. the works that are to do with Disney or Minnie, Minnie Mouse in particular um, use these kind of apertures that would be familiar from cartoons of the 40s and the 50s yeah. that use that kind of you know that's all folks and then we're zooming out and coming in with that kind of aperture like cinematic lens and there's quite a few of them uh, that, that, that you've made that use uh, Minnie Mouse as a kind of abstracted subject and I think they're fascinating in terms of what they look like but what, what could you speak us through those briefly what what, what are now I'll, I'll flash up another one as well yeah um the thing that i realized um with the vinyl was that i had the opportunity to do something of a palimpsest in other words i could say what was underneath this painting or in the case of um uh the ubu ones that it could be um, as if it was a, a, a stage flat flipped round or that you had this depth because I was using stretchers that were an inch and a half deep and it meant there were two layers. So there's so many opportunities that that ignites. One is the, the drop shadow. It throws the uh, front surface forward because it isolates it and makes it more like sculpture actually because you have this little shadow effect that is is behind it and sets off. If you do the lighting right, you have to do really severe lighting on them. Yeah. Um, the other thing that it does is that it means you can have a completely different story going on in the background. So one of the ones that was at Gazelli is called Newsman and that's four layers. Um, and it means that you can have things kind of tucked behind that you don't quite see, like in a painting that you're you're restoring and you find that, you know, the, um, uh, whatever it is, Monday is underneath, you know? Um, so. 
<clears throat> um, Salvador Mundi. Um, you know, so it's that kind of fine art um, concern, but also it's the backdrop. It's like, you know, the scenic behind the, um, <clears throat> behind the actor or the, um, the back projection or any of those techniques that I saw my father use. Um, it, it gives you an opportunity of staging your painting differently than just on a, a, a straight, um, you know, normal painting of one surface. So that drop shadow you see there on the left of the curve um, of the Minnie Mouse corset here um, <clears throat> is, um, you know, that's part of the painting. The other thing that it does, which is just thrilling, is for me, is that you, as you walk past the picture, the um, if you have a painted background or even the shadowed background, the image shifts slightly. So it's like a cartoon. It suddenly goes into motion and the viewer then can um, decide which composition appeals to them the most. You know, do they like it from this angle or that angle? Um, so again, it, it picks up on the clear film strip um, and also the the idea of the animators acetate where you do the black line on the front and then you flip it over and do the color behind. Um, all those things are kind of available to you. And then there's another one. If you sew straight um, vinyl to vinyl, uh, you're, you're editing the film together as it were, um, you get a drop shadow where the seam is. And so you get a, a fictional drawn gray line, just like a big pencil line on the, the back um, canvas. So just to backtrack here, we're talking about two layers always, and sometimes three or four layers um, of, that are spaced apart. So it's a, it's a slight bar relief. Um, hard to, I mean, the good thing is you kind of have to see the picture, um, you know, that they don't reproduce 100%. Um, and, um, you know, I, I wrestle with that. <laughs> But I, I also like the fact that that, it, you know, that the real thing has a difference than say just a photograph mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. Um, so, and these are, these ones, these two mini ones are mini as, as pregnant. Um, so it's that she and Mickey were never married. That's not my story. That's a fact. Um, and um, it, she does have children. So, um, you know, the kind of um, illegitimacy of that fascinated me and, and her kind of flamboyance and the way she dresses and so forth. I, I love all of that, you know. <laughs> Amazing. Great. Thanks. And, and, and these, these, uh, the cut works for things like Cell, they, they do, they do a lot of the, the, the vinyl, um, the projection, the sort of drop shadows are really, yeah. um, very, um, prominent on those. Um, I'm yeah. conscious of time. And what I would like to do is just, uh, I'll close with, um, one final work, which is from some of your most recent, um, uh, works that you've been doing and the mannequin defectors and this is a, a detail of one one of the works in relation to that the work is now being done with cardboard and uh, constructions using that as a material and also continuing over the disney theme and the aperture and the lens theme coming out here as well and this yeah. has also associated with it um comic strip or a graphic novel style um, comic book work as well. So there's like an adaptation almost, or mm -hmm. there's a symbiosis mm -hmm. between the works and the works on paper that are um, the, the, the comics. Is, it, is that yeah. something that I'm correct in assuming? Yeah, and I always end up cutting stuff. <clears throat> so I like the idea of, uh, you know, uh, that again, you're, you're really doing a quilt. You're just doing it with glue instead of um, sewing. Um, and also the, <clears throat> the material is, is still yielding soft and warm and you know I, I can't I can't work on wood I can work on canvas or on cardboard because it has that that sort of yield um, there's one that I don't know if we have an image of that is uh, a, about um, Robert Fraser and uh, has a, a lens actually looking at you that is um, uh, held by Dennis Hopper who um, I knew and um, that he thought of himself as more of a photographer and an artist than as an actor Mm -hmm. um, and so the lens is, is flipped out at you. All of these works, I, I kind of made the, the rule for myself that I didn't make pictures of things, I made things. So the objects of the 60s and then the representational format of re representing objects, still they were life size. And these are the first ones that I've that have gone down in scale a little bit because uh, I did, I went on the DC March, um, the, the 2017, uh, protest march, women's march in DC. And I was so impressed with all the homemade art that was being carried as, as banners, posters, and so forth. And we took a, a big mural that we, we did called Work in Progress, a women's mural to DC. 
And um, so I wanted to do friezes of figures. Uh, instead of doing the pop art thing of something bang in the center of the canvas, et cetera, mm -hmm. I wanted to do something that was um, a multiplicity of figures that were more anonymous. Um, so they're mannequins, um, but but also to try to capture that that sense of a, a lot of figures in a in a context which is much more in motion and it is frozen motion. It, they are not at rest. But finally, I wanted to have glass on the front of them so that the viewer then became part of the march by the reflection of themselves in in the glass. Mm -hmm. um, so all these are about that that kind of interchange of uh, proximity to a lot of other people and trying to look back at art history and, and take up the challenge of the diptych, which is really an uncomfortable thing to, to work with, and also to, um, to try to review the fact that, hey, it's simple to put something in the middle of a picture, um, hey, you're on camera, you're the, you're the close up, you're the center, as opposed to this freeze feeling of action. Um, so um, yeah, so in, in the cinematic terms, that is about motion and movement, which is, of course, the cardinal kind of thing of the movie. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely fascinating. We'll have to stop there, uh, Jan, in terms of uh, me and Joe talking to you, but we would love if um, participants uh, and, and people watching um, would like to answer, ask any questions that they might have towards you. We've got a sort of 20 minute now uh, slot of time in which we have time for questions that if you'd be willing to take some questions, that would be wonderful. Um, while we sort through those questions, I will just ask one final thing, which I think might help us tie this together a little bit, which is the idea of the audience and always the, the, the audience is present constantly in the construction mm -hmm. of the work, that, that they're always gonna be almost interpolated into the scene, into the scenario. It goes, it's there in the May West, it's there in these latest works, reflecting the viewer and sort of mm -hmm. making them be a part of the, the socio-political context for what's going on and absorbing them and I think that that really fits nicely into the idea of stitching the viewer in we talked we spoke a little time ago about the idea of suturing or the French theory yes. of like the yes. suturing the spectator and yeah. stitching yeah. them in and that being a part of the sort of power of the image in that way <laughs> um, and the images as, as constructed in that kind of montage yeah so that's something um, yeah, I, I love that word nicely. stitching because of course it's stitching and, and there are many times that like when I was working on the, the, the Lidner doll that I thought, hey, I'd really make a good um, plastic surgeon, you know, I really know the shapes of these things and where you put the stitch to make it all work here, you know, <laughs> pull yeah. up that the side of that face. <laughs> And I had a needle that was this long, that was an upholstery needle that you could go right through something and then, you know, make a dimple here if you wanted to. <laughs> it's pretty brutal. Anyway, suturing, suturing is, is good. I, I think it does speak a moment to the, the more recent things that we've done as community projects, which are large scale murals. The latest was a 6,000 square foot mural that we did with the community and uh, worked with about 260 different uh, people that were non-artists um, to produce a huge mural. So in other words, the, the spectator actually really was part of the process. Mm -hmm. And um, then that was digitally put together by my son, um, you know, so that the idea is that, you know, you actually go back into the very form, formula of making things that's digital, that's movie, that's all of that. So all of that crisscrosses those zones. Um, and uh, they, those murals could not exist without the lens, the digital, you know, formula, putting these things together. And in fact, we're engaged in making a film about that right now. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's interesting the the bridges between now these, these form, you know, the, the different forms of art. And I think, you know, the, the sequential, uh, thinking that that is involved in the in those things is is part of that kind of process yeah, yeah so wonderful. yeah suture is great it's a great word <laughs> um, great so uh, if, if it's okay with you Jen I'll open up to a couple of questions that we've had so far um one that I'm not sure of the answer because I'm not sure when she died but I think it's a great question to ask is did Mae West ever see the work of Mae West dressing table I don't I, I, I don't know if you could answer that oh uh, she could have she could have but I bet she didn't just because she didn't but you know um, because <laughs> she was alive in 67 when we did um, Sergeant Pepper and uh, permission had to be you know gleaned from her to have her appear on that um, that cover 
And so she, um, uh, you know, Brian Epstein wrote to her and uh, her, her response was, no, I don't want to be on this cover. Uh, what would I be doing in a Lonely Hearts Club? Um, and uh, so the Beatles <laughs> had to write to her and say, no, 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 you're not, you're not in a Lonely Hearts Club. You're just part of a crowd of the band. And of course, she was my choice to put on the cover, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, she very nearly edited herself out of that film. <laughs> um, great. And then I've got a question here from Simon Ray, who says, are your pictures uh, ever designed to be seen from the back as well as from the front? Oh, I, that's a delicious question. And there have been times where I've turned them over and thought, my goodness, they're so interesting. There's such a mess behind here, you know dare I do a picture that's all all the seams. And um, I've got as close as this of backlighting them so that the seams make these really strange brown shadows on, on the front that are all irregular and they look really, really tasty. Um, I've never really had the full courage to do that. I did two nudes where the seams are exposed to the front and I'm living with it. I don't know that it's quite right. I have a, you know, maybe I'm too neat. I'm worried about that. Um, I, I, I'll address that. Thank you for that question. Um, I, it, it needs, I also, I corset them on the back. I, um, I tighten up the seams by sewing on the back. So there's stitches going backwards and forwards um, on the back where I'm tightening them down um, away from showing uh, through the vinyl. Um, so that it folds back. Um, so yeah, it's a really good question. It would be an interesting area to investigate. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a question from uh, Jules LeBoc who writes, um, I remember your masks at the 1981 Ruralist show, perhaps mm -hmm. quite the best things in the show. Um, could you place those in your development? Uh, yeah, they, they're in the, the ceramic period, so 1967, 8, 9, uh, through the early 70s, that I did um, a lot of um, things in terracotta, um, and I still have some of those. Um, I also did some tapestry masks at that time, um, and it, it was something I could do with, you know, young girls around, young chattery girls, Libby and Daisy. And um, it also meant that um, I, I'd learned the technique of coil pots. And so that became a complete versatility of, of how to make um, faces or hands or whatever. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, those were largely based on mythologies. So I did a Janus head and I did um, he uh, faces as though things were projected on them. And I did an Ophelia. Um, I did uh, Macbeth for the Arden Shakespeare series um, and things like that. Uh, it became, I really needed to explore realism um, and, you know, to really see how far I could actually push the detailing of uh, a perception of how a face, you know, was, you know, every, every little, you know, like the coil, the curl in the corner of a mouth or the edge of an eyelid. Um, so I was just deep into that. So the clay was was very much about that. And of course, my mother knew all about it. So I had a good, good backup team. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great. Wonderful. Um, I have a question about the whereabouts of the rodeo cowboy. A Pallant House. It is a Pallant House, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And, and Mae West is there and the sorceress as well. Um, and um, yeah, they uh, we restored the sorceress when uh, Liberty and I were there um, last uh, 2019. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. so, yeah. <laughs> um, and I have a question, which is something that I suppose a lot of artists are being asked within the current context of the moment, which is um, how it is working in the context of the pandemic and how that's changed your practice or your outlook, what, what it's meant for you in terms of um, how you do your work. Well, I, I think, you know, artists are always crying out for the, um, the ivory tower um, and, you know, that they seek isolation and quiet and um, detachment and so forth. So be careful what you wish for <laughs> is, is kind of that, that territory. But um, uh, for me, um, it, it was an enormous challenge because when we were, uh, when we moved to the lockdown directive, we were halfway through a mural that was to go up um, in the summer of 2020 
on time to celebrate the uh, ratification of women's voting rights. And it was a 6,000 square foot mural. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and it was a community mural with the, the fact that we were going to be doing workshops all around Utah and that just had to shut down. So we had to get extremely creative and figure out how on earth we were gonna do this under those conditions. And the blessing of the computer and you know the postal service was what made it happen. Um, you know that we were able to do it because of um, you know access to everybody in the world. I mean, it was suddenly it was going to be Utah centric working on the mural, and I suddenly thought, well, it, we are all experiencing the same thing. We need to go to Edinburgh, and we need to go to Milan, and we need to go to Vienna, and you know see if if people would be willing to help us with this mural because it's crisis and we need lots of help. And and it was amazing. I mean, it it happened, and I I did feel tentative at many points. You know, thinking you know people might just throw this back in my face and say, "What do you mean? In a serious situation like this, you want me to not only." homeschool my kids, cook dinners, and the house is getting messier faster, and, you know, all these things, and I'm scared to death, um, you want me to do art, <laughs> you know, so, um, but they didn't, and, and we had an uh, absolutely amazing experience because of that, so I, I, I suppose it nearly brings me to tears if I think about it, because it was, it was so enormous, um, we have, as you know, the, our generations, we have never experienced anything like this. And, you know, to have the the kindness of the community, the um, the support of the people who funded Zions Bank, funded this huge project. Um, you know, it, it it's 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 an enormity, and it reminds us of our humanity at a time when we are constantly reminded of the deterioration of our humanity. So uh, for me, uh, the pandemic has, you know, in terms of what people have um, experienced and transcended has been amazing. And we must remember the mourning that many people have had to experience and, um, you know, put our arms around those people when we're allowed to hug again. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I'll close down with two questions. Um, one is a, a really interesting one, I think, which says that your idea of soft sculpture came to you on a bus in London. Do you think that your art would have developed in a completely different way had you not come to London and stayed in California? Absolutely. Without question. I would have been a, um, a beach girl making art, you know, and having uh, the California sun get me too tan. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I, I would have had a totally different perspective. Um, it, it, it was, I, I had the, um, the curiosity and the, the rebellion in me. Um, and I, you know, I certainly always went left when everybody else went right. Um, but, but it was like London lit the fuse between my right brain and my left brain. So I could function instead of just functioning on an academic level, I was functioning on, um, you know, whatever the right brain is. I know that's a simplistic um, uh, a simplification of what the brain is like, but for the moment, you know, it, it just suddenly those things came together and it, 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 it was exponentially changing the way I used my mind. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, everything was available to me. I mean, California at that time was very provincial. Suddenly I'm in a, a, a city that has the theater that I was longing to see, my whole, the whole of my father's family is theater um, and the music I wanted to hear, a, a huge amount of, of uh, museums that I still haven't got to the bottom of, you know. Um, so no, it was a, a damn burst of dreams, basically, yeah. <laughs> And of course, your studies here as well, Jan, I think, do you see that they took a particular shape that they wouldn't have taken if you'd continued with your course, perhaps that it was a UCLA, wasn't it, with your, with the, the studies that you undertook at the Slade and the other artists that you began to kind of work with your contemporaries then and your teachers as well, who were supportive as right. well as, was right. it Rain, was it Rainer Bannon's course that the court told yes. you? Yes, yes, yeah, and that was, right. so that, that was electric and his whole handling of art history was amazing. And in and, and we might have to remember at that time, your art history textbook, which I have just over there, um, is in black and white. It wasn't even color, you know, so, you know, try to imagine that. And so then I could see everything in color in the 
National Gallery um, and, you know, the V&A and so on and so forth. And of course, I was in France as well, but I and Holland and Denmark and so forth. But um, it, you know, it, it was it was absolutely pivotal um, point in my life. And, you know, I I I woke up you know, uh, intellectually and otherwise. And so, yeah, um, and, I, and I think, you know, there was much, it, there's much applause to the, uh, the UCLA education that I had, but it was still an extension really of, the, of the, the high school thing where you learned stuff and then you spouted it out on the test. Whereas I went straight into studio practice at, at the Slade um, and, you know, hearing, you know, top intellectuals in the art historical framing of, of thinking was just, fabulous for me at that time you know it's what i needed um yeah magic <laughs> great thank you so much uh, we'll, we'll have to come to a close now uh, we're hitting up to our time so we'll, we'll, we'll all say goodbye but just a really amazing uh, session jan thanks so much for sharing your insights on your amazing work mm -hmm. and it's links to cinema and hopefully we've we've uh, you know opened a box slightly in terms of thinking that this is really is a central part of your practice and there's you know something that's really you've said it really underpins a lot of what you have to say and do in relationship to the visual arts so it's really amazing um thanks so much for coming along and joining in with us Pleasure. Thanks, Dan. Absolutely. Pleasure as ever. You're getting lots of um, lots of thanks, Jane England, Amy Tevis, lots of people in the audience um, saying how much they've enjoyed this. So we can share that with you afterwards. So thank really? you very much. Yeah. We'll see well, you very soon. Thanks for coming. It's a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>